The purpose of uh, our gathering here today is I'm conducting an oral history uh, with Roger Brockett, who is to my left. Um, Roger is known to many people for many different things. I brought along a recent republication of a classic text that uh, many people still use uh, to teach uh, finite dimensional linear systems, but there's much more to tell. And I think that the way that these oral histories like to start is by just some words about um, the very beginnings of uh, one's life uh, that you remember and how you um, uh, grew up and uh, where you went to school, and uh, maybe just um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Roger. Sure. Uh, so I was the youngest of seven children, born in a hospital in Wadsworth, Ohio. My parents lived uh, a couple miles east of the very small town of Seville, Ohio, and um, my childhood was remarkably uneventful in the sense that very stable family. Um, children preceded me, had a whole range of uh, skills and limitations, and so I saw some of everything, um, and mainly growing up on a farm, I saw plenty of opportunity to ask questions about how things worked. And I did find out, uh, for example, even though I lived very closely with animals every day, I found machines more interesting than the animals. And uh, in fact, one of my children told me that you don't know how lucky you are that you knew what you wanted to do from almost the time you were born. That's not typical, he assured me. And so stop asking me what I want to do. <laughs> so I did. Anyway, um, I, my high school was uh, small, average graduating class of probably something like 20 uh, children. And um, I would say that I did have a plain geometry teacher who influenced me in a couple different ways. One of them, his, he believed in me enough to take time in the evening on one occasion when I was preparing for a big statewide test to take time to uh, coach me a bit. But he also let me know that he valued my opinion about uh, which teachers were doing their job well and which were not, and um, things that were just between him and me. So that was fun. That was uh, fun? Well, fun, I don't know. Uh, athletics was a big part of my um, life all the way through uh, undergraduate school. And I think um, I understand better why athletics is taken into account to such an extent in both in, in college admissions and also in uh, employers uh, seeking to add to their expertise. Uh, there's something about the learning about competition, learning about the fact that you're going to lose sometime, and that's not the end of the earth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, that's, that's, um, let's say that takes me up to age 21. Okay, so uh, just picking up on that, um, that transitions neatly to your um, alma mater, where you spent a significant fraction of your education and uh, this reminds me, uh, you probably played football for the mighty Case Western football team. I did. I played football and basketball and got varsity letters in both. Um, I was not great at either one of those by any means, 
but I deeply enjoyed it. And uh, I think I uh, kept myself healthy in the process. But about college, uh, I majored in engineering science, which uh, was appealing to me because it was all in, it convinced me that it was all encompassing. Now, of course, that's silly, but it did appear to be the most uh, encompassing major that I was, uh, would have been able to take. And my only goal in college really was to understand things. I didn't have any particular interest in grades. I didn't have any uh, particular career path in mind either. Um, but I did want to gain the understanding of as much stuff as I could because it was interesting. Not because uh, I was uh, particularly interested in pleasing anyone, but just because it was interesting. And you liked it well enough that you kept doing it because you, uh, oh, I liked it. you yeah. have uh, a number of uh, degrees from case. Yes. Seven, um, seven years, uh, <laughs> three degrees. Three degrees. But yeah. I would like to say, um, be, if and when we're going to leave case, I would like to say that uh, I was extremely fortunate in terms of the timing of my coming of age, so to speak, and the people that I was able to interact with. And again, not necessarily because they were um, absolutely astoundingly brilliant people, but because they cared. And so, for example, in 1957, Sputnik went up. Now, that doesn't happen every year. It happens once in nobody else's lifetime, anybody's lifetime, it happens once. What was the effect of that? Well, the next year, Congress passed the National Defense Education Act. And as part of that, they made available a bunch of fellowships for people, to three-year fellowships to go to graduate school so we could catch up with the Russians. Now, that might or might not have been the right thing to do at the time, but I can tell you that I received one of those fellowships as soon as I graduated with my bachelor's degree. And between the time that my wife and I got married after the, after our, uh, after we graduated from college and the time that we, I finished graduate school and she uh, finished her super, her additional grad education, was that we had saved enough money for the first down payment of our house. So graduate students nowadays are not so fortunate in that regard. They graduate with huge debts, and uh, it just is incomparable uh, and amazing that such a disparity should be allowed to exist over such a short period of time. Um, I, can, I can go on and tell you a bit more about how it happened that Case was able to garner eight of these National Defense Education Scholarships. So Donald P. Ekman, who's a name that people probably know the name but little else about. Um, he started the Systems Research Center at Case in, in and about 1960. And he's now known as because the uh, Donald P. Ekman Award is named after him, but uh, he was a chemical engineer by trade, and um, started the Systems Research Center as a bold initiative. Nothing like that existed at, certainly not at Case, and I think it was perhaps not at that time anywhere in the nation. 
And that, together with the uh, scare that the Russians put into uh, people who mattered in the U.S., he was able to write a proposal and get these uh, fellowships. And he also was able to hire some uh, people who would not, would not necessarily be the first person you would think of. For example, my advisor, Mike Masarovic, uh, was a Serbian electrical engineer who was a bit of a renegade in the sense that he was. He told me that he was assigned to go to a job in a mine doing something or other when he graduated with his PhD, and he said, "No, I'm not going to do that." And uh, he eventually worked his way into a, a position and as a researcher at MIT, and then he was hired by Case. But in any case. Uh, Mike was extremely supportive, very visionary, not very much on details, but very much of a visionary. You ought to think big. Don't think small, think big. And uh, they were instrumental in broadening my horizons. For example, Case brought in, with his help in part and with Ekman's help, brought in uh, researchers from the Soviet Union that uh, were at the top of their field and would come with their um, person to keep them in tow so they didn't defect. But anyway, so you'd be sitting around the room with a few scientists and, a, and one uh, enforcer, and this was, this was enlightening to me. Uh, it made you feel like this was important stuff. And that's important. Did, did you, um, following up on this uh, train of thought, did, did you go to Moscow in 1960? Regrettably not. Uh, Masarovic did, and Ekman did, and they like to tell the story that they came from the far corners of the earth and met at a statue in Stockholm and then went together to Moscow. But I heard about it. We had the, in the library, we had the uh, proceedings of that conference, but regrettably not, I was not in attendance. The, uh, just for people who are watching the video, um, we're sitting here um, at the beautiful new building at Harvard University, the School of Engineering. And um, it's August 2021. And uh, what we're calling is IFAC, the very first International Federation of Automatic Control in Moscow. And this is another place where uh, people from the Soviet Union and the US who were interested in the kinds of engineering questions that enabled Sputnik and enabled subsequent space programs. So it was a very heady time, and, and so this is uh, pretty exciting to have lived through that. Absolutely, absolutely true. Um, One of the things that I noticed too about this is that Mike Mazarovich, your uh, mentor uh, at Case, um, is uh, still with us. He's 92 years old. Regrettably not. Oh, he, is that true? He um, died about a year ago. Oh. Ah. And uh, he, he he was a supportive person, and but more interested in big pictures like the Club of Rome and things like that. Uh, he he. Uh, had a charming wife, and she predeceased him, and he was not quite the same after that. Well, that's too bad. I, I, sorry that I have out of date information on, I, I, on that. The um, just to pick up on this a little bit uh, before we leave, case um, you've been a very loyal alumnus, and uh, you've done a lot for the uh, institution. I think. Anything you want to share? Well, I served on their visiting committee for a while, but I, I would say that the following thing about Case. I think that 
they had a very dynamic president, T. Keith Glennon, in the years that I was there as a student. And I think uh, they were not so fortunate in the intermediate, uh, intermediate years, but now I think they're back on track again. And I did spend some time on their visiting committee. I don't think I was terribly effective, sorry to say. Uh, You're but, probably being too modest. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat that. <laughs> um, but I think they're on a good path, a, a much better path now, and that uh, they will rise again. So you mentioned that you uh, were um, drawn very much to engineering, to understand how things work. But a lot of people um, who've known you professionally throughout the years think of you as somebody who kind of moved into mathematics. And in, in some ways, um, you know, uh, you seem to have similar characteristics to the late, great Raoul Bott, who was trained as an electrical engineer, but became a, uh, a very well-known mathematician. Do you want to talk anything about that transition? Well, any, any comparison of that nature is welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I have enormous respect for Raoul Bott. Um, let, let me say a bit about that. When I uh, took my first job at MIT, and that was uh, 1973 um, or four. Anyway, I, again, by contrast with today's job market, I want to tell people that I never wrote an application. What happened was is that my advisor invited the chairman of the electrical engineering department at MIT to give a talk. We sat down for about an hour talking about things. And uh, very soon thereafter, I got a letter in the mail appointing me assistant professor at MIT. It's not going to happen again, I don't think. And uh, if you wanted to make the argument that he was just lucky, I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> I have been extremely lucky in that respect. Anyway, I went to MIT, and that was really exciting. Big names, lots of them around every corner. Um, lots of... Uh, ambitious people, and that was good, and I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, new beginnings are always ripe with possibilities, and it's hard to say no to anything when it's new, and that was great. I, I appreciated my time at MIT very much, and you might, and I've been asked often, why did you, you look, you're an engineer. Why did you leave MIT to go to Harvard? Harvard's not so much known for engineering. That was dumb. Why did you do that? Um, I can tell you the reason. Uh, I thought that I would have fewer committees to go to, and I would have more time to think, and I would have to write fewer proposals. Now, that last part was only true for a short time, but the other parts were more or less sound thinking on my part. And so after six very exciting years at MIT, and, and I should say something about that period as far as automatic control is concerned, and that is, is that at the same time, or very nearly the same time that I went to MIT, the famous group at RIAS, the Research Institute for Advanced Study, it, uh, organized by the Martin Marietta Company, their people uh, moved to Brown University, and Brown is only uh, 50 miles away or something like that. And so we used to have joint seminars. And so uh, I got to know Solomon Lefschetz that way, who is... Raoul Bott's equal, perhaps, in terms of mathematical chops, and uh, Harold Kushner, Murray Wonham, and uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting 
important people, you know, Joe LaSalle and so forth. So anyway, we had joint seminars and also included uh, Larry Ho and Art Bryson from Harvard. And that was, that was enlightening and broadening of horizons and so forth and so on. So there was a little nexus there, which uh, was important in terms of um, broadening people's view as to what research ought to be. All that uh, was before I came to Harvard. So why did I come to Harvard? I told you that. Um, was I, did, it, did I have buyer's remorse? No. Uh, I think one thing that people need to understand is that if you put too much like-minded expertise in a small space, you uh, encourage people to become narrow. And if you have room to expand like a nice gas in an open container, then they can explore various parts of the universe that they might otherwise not. And I think that was, uh, I think I lived that. So, you know, one of the things that um, certainly you did, and it, I, as far as I recall from just being around you in those days a little bit uh, after you came to Harvard, is that um, you became very uh, focused and you became a focal point for thinking about nonlinear control in a way that was different from what most people thought of uh, as nonlinear control in years prior to that. And there, were, there was quite a uh, little group that grew up around that of people that visited and that you interacted with you want to reflect on any of that? I do. I do. I do. Uh, I, and let me start just a, just a few years earlier. Um, while I was at MIT, uh, I had directed by that time 10 PhD students. Among them were Jan Willems and his twin brother, uh, did a master's student uh, degree with me, uh, his twin brother Jacques. Now, Jan went on to have a uh, absolutely pivotal career in European control and was a joy to work with and to have. And he was and his brother also was very imaginative and very inventive, and we wrote some papers together in which we're, I'm very happy about. Uh, I was working at that point in stability theory, which is the only interesting problems are nonlinear. And that, that theory was made famous by a Russian by the name of Azerman, and he made a conjecture that was easily shown to be wrong, but nonetheless, in trying to make it right, there was a lot of imaginative stuff, especially by the group at, at Brown that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I had a taste of success there, and I wanted to do something equally, dare I say, flamboyant, or uh, I don't know what the right word is when you're talking about science, but I didn't want to do a small thing. I wanted to do a big thing. And um, so I felt that we, it was necessary really to do something quite, quite novel. And at that time, due to uh, the electrical engineering department at MIT having such close relationship with Lincoln Laboratory, uh, I had some consulting arrangement with them and the area where I was consulting was on satellites. And there were a couple aspects of satellite control that were of interest to them. The first was how to keep a satellite fixed at a certain point over the Earth, uh, given that you could only make observations 
accurately a few times a day, or maybe even once a day. And given the fact that contrary to what Physics 101 says, the Earth is not perfectly round. It has concentrations of mass here and there, and so it looks more like oblate. And the satellite would, left to its own desire, would drift backwards to a place over Mexico, or if it were on the other side, back to Mexico. But they didn't want Mexico, they wanted Middle Atlantic. So how do you keep a satellite in place by using gas thrusters to keep it over the middle of the Atlantic. So that was a problem that I, I worked on a bit. And uh, that problem was good in the sense that it was almost linear. And, and I worked out those equations in such a um, simplified form that it was that I actually used that problem in in my textbook that you mentioned earlier. Anyway, that was one. But the other part of the problem was is that satellites have antennas on them, and you want the antenna to be pointed at the Earth, not somewhere else. And so you are control, trying to control rigid body dynamics, and this set me on the path of how do you control something whose intrinsic geometry is the space of all orientations rather than some nice neat vector space. And that played a huge role in the next 15 years of my life. But I didn't answer your question yet. Graduate <laughs> students. Graduate students have been the lifeblood of my existence. All right, so it's, you mentioned 62, but who's counting? Anyway, uh, there were students that uh, contributed in very different ways to uh, the way I thought about the world. But let me say this, is that I found them energizing and fun to work with. And to the extent that I put them on career paths that they could then sustain, I feel proud about that. Uh, so I mentioned John and Jacques and uh, failed to mention many others, but once I got to Harvard, one of the things that was good is that we had some money, uh, again, accidentally, we had some money that would allow us to bring postdocs. And so uh, when I first came to Harvard, we had, many, I'll mention a few names here, uh, Seussman and Yerzhevik and uh, Krenner and Paul Furman and, oh, the list can go on. But the important part of the mix were the graduate students. And the graduate students are people who have gone on to have extremely successful careers by the measures I understand. People like Alan Welsky, who was a full professor at MIT, David Dobkinu is the dean of uh, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Princeton for eight years or so. And uh, I mentioned Jacques before, he was the rector of the University of Ghent for a couple of terms, lasting about a decade. And then on the more scientific side, John Barris, who started the uh, Engineering Research Center sponsored by the National Science Foundation in the first batch of these. And John and was generous enough to include Harvard's program with that. And we uh, benefited by that funding for a long time. But Krishna Prasad, Tony Block, and John Bailey, uh, <laughs> all of whom uh, worked on a variety of problems. I tried not to have people do the same thing. And that again is a way that you can keep yourself um, alive by not falling into the trap of becoming too narrow. The, um, yeah, I, I, I think back on your careers, uh, you know, the cohort would turn over a bit and the, um, 
sociology of the place would change a little bit, but uh, uh, I, I do remember being there with Krishna and John Barris and David Dobkin. That was a pretty uh, rich experience, actually. So um, we're coming uh, uh, somewhat toward the, uh, I think, the end of the hour. And no, you're there are other things no, you're to not. talk about. I want to talk about more things. All right. All right. So um, I, I can feed you another question, but I think maybe uh, uh, you can uh, improvise. Well, what I want, what I want to address is um, the fact that around, well, in the early 80s, I decided that I had done what I thought was interesting enough to do in the area of differential geometry, and I decided to start a robotics lab. Now, this uh, was an abrupt change, and the opportunity for failure was certainly there if you looked at it from the outside. I, didn't entertain that possibility myself. But uh, you could say, why would you do something where other people already have a head start on you? The people at Carnegie Mellon and so forth were well ahead. Um, why did you do this? And I think there are three reasons. One of them, three important reasons. One of them is, is that I thought that nonlinear control had entered a sort of a Baroque stage and I didn't want to do that anymore. Another one was, is that I had my, our two oldest children were approaching college and they had been on the leading edge of the uh, personal computer world and uh, had filled our houses with, our house with such things from some time then. And I saw how exciting they found it and I, didn't think they shared that same excitement for different for geometry. <laughs> so I said, well, gee, if I'm going to interact with uh, the now generation, maybe it would be better to do something that's more now-like. Um, it's, it's also true that about that time that uh, the Engineering Research Center was beginning to, get, it had begun to get funded, and part of the um, plan for that was that there was supposed to be joint industry university collaboration. Now, I didn't believe this could work. I never believed it could work, and I was, I was paying lip service to it to some extent. Uh, not flattering, but Anyway, uh, I thought that if I were going to make the case that we were on board with this, that I had to do something that would, that industry cared about. So uh, I broadened my view of robotics to include computer vision. And uh, so this was more or less response to NSF personal considerations and um, boredom. So the big challenges were, how do you set up a laboratory? You need space, you need equipment, you need a, a certain size of operation. You cannot have a one-man robotics laboratory. The cost of the equipment is simply too big. You need to uh, amortize that, and you need space. So as people often say about universities, space is the last frontier. You have to struggle for it oftentimes, but not me, because I was lucky. So the administration provided space without any struggle. Um, my previous sponsors, particularly people in the Army Research Office, were forthcoming with the kind of help that uh, was needed. And Amazingly enough, there was a uh, heretofore hidden, but there nonetheless, group of people at Harvard who were interested and felt like they wanted to be part of this. And of course, as you know, you played a role in that also by starting the laboratory and spent 
I don't know, one year? It was a year, yeah. Yeah, I spent a year here helping make that get off the ground. So I think if, if people want to see it, be, a former student of mine said one time when I was starting the robotics laboratory, he said, why don't you leave that stuff to other people and just concentrate on research? So I want to tell him an answer now, 20, 30, 40 years later, is that out of that research came two things that I am uh, well, has have been kindly received by the research community. One of them is uh, relates to the kinematic ch chain idea. The in robotics for years and years and years, uh, people had thought about kinematic chains in a sort of a uh, I would say idiosyncratic way. And what I noticed early on was is that you could write these things as a product of elements of a Lie algebra or Lie group. And uh, then it was quite easy to say what the problems were. The notation, instead of being a page long, became a line long. And that was good. But I loved it. And it still uh, has found its way into textbooks, more than one. and. That makes me happy. Second thing is, is that uh, so far as computer vision is concerned, one of the problems is that if two, two pictures are taken of the same thing, but their camera is a little bit one way or another, um, you might want to put those in alignment. And one thing that you could ask is, if I make a distance preserving transformation, uh, that is an orthogonal transformation to try to line up the pictures. What is that transformation that would do it with ending up with the least error between after you register them? There's going to be some error because life is like that, but how can you minimize that through an orthogonal transformation? And that simple question led me to think and think and think. And I was sitting in the women's faculty room in Berkeley, California, and I realized that I could write this equation in such a simple way. And uh, that turned out, again, luckily, no forethought on my part, but luckily, that equation turned out to be related to integrable systems, related to algorithms for finding uh, eigenvalues of matrices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it lives today, well, among other ways, in, the, in a textbook written by Uwe Helmke and uh, John Moore and other places as well. So message change fields with confidence and don't get in a rut. New stuff is everywhere. Okay, so um, we're coming to the end of uh, the hour and the question is, um, what does the future hold? Well, there are certainly no shortage of possibilities. Uh, medicine, quantum mechanics, nano, automobile control, driverless cars, you name it. Problem is how to take these uh, questions and put them into a form that is mathematically amenable. So as an example, I would say that the 2012 Nobel Prize in uh, molecular biology or some such was given to a, a Japanese person by the name of Yamanaka. And the clever thing that he did was he was able to change a stem cell, uh, change a skin cell, which is totally differentiated cell, back into a stem cell, which is pluripotent cell. cell. And he did this 
in a way that uh, rewarded patience. He only was able to just try a large number of possible transcription factors to try to incorporate this, and he found a combination of four that would do this job. It might be, in fact, I've worked on possible possibilities of formulating this problem mathematically as a control problem and finding out which sequence of transcription factors in which order would make this transition as efficiently as possible. Now, whatever model we were using, and, and this was joint work with people at the medical school at uh, the University of Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, uh, whatever methods we were using were highly approximate. It's very complicated stuff if you want to model it in detail. So maybe the mathematics will work, and if it does, it'll be a um, substantial contribution. If not, uh, we'll have to build a better model. Okay, thanks very much. And You're I welcome. think it's a very positive note that if you define systems and control broadly enough, uh, all of these things are part of the mix. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Okay.